I'm really pleased to introduce to you Tom Forge. Uh, Tom is a nematologist and a soil microbiologist with the Summerlin Research Center in Canada. He's been looking at soil health in relationship to plant parasitic nematodes for many years, as well as the overall soil food web. And I've asked him to talk a little bit particularly about <laughs> plant parasitic nematodes and root health, what are they doing, and some ways that we can manage them. So thank you very much, Tom. We'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Tiana. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're all refreshed. Um, so earlier, uh, you know, in some of the previous presentations that Tiana uh, gave, uh, she described already how plant parasitic nematodes can serve as indica good indicators of soil health and, and a little bit about their relationship with, with uh, orchard productivity. And so in this presentation, I'm going to flesh out, you know, some more details about the role of plant parasitic nematodes in orchards how they affect orchard productivity and how their populations respond to soil management practices to kind of embellish or, or to build on uh, those points that, that uh, uh, Tiana made earlier on. And so just yeah, once again, a lag on my first slide. There we go. So one of the main reasons plant parasitic nematodes are good indicators is that they directly affect uh, root health. And, and you know, I think this is fairly obvious. We already talked about how they have these stylets, uh, as you see in the top right-hand corner, uh, that they use for puncturing root cells and, uh, and, and even for gaining entry into roots for the endoparasites. And so they, so they you know, have definite direct impact on, on root health. They're well-known uh, plant pathogens or plant pests, if you will. And so for this reason, they're, they're good indicators. Um, and uh, we also know uh, that they're widespread. Uh, and so for something to be useful as an indicator, it needs to be fairly widespread and present you know, in, in most places. But they, vary, uh, at, but they exist at variable population densities, depending on where you are. And so that also kind of adds to their value uh, you know, if that variation in population densities is related to the broader question of soil health. And so even though they do directly affect root health, at the scale of orchards and, and variation among orchards out on the landscape, those relationships with productivity are, are complicated. And we'll, we'll dive in a little bit more detail about this later on, but just you know, to very quickly go over it, uh, with nematodes, there are no obvious signs or symptoms such as certain other types of diseases. And, and they, the populations often get confounded with other soil stresses, which is part of the reason we look at them as part of the so broader question of soil health but it, it also adds to the difficulty in, in relating their populations to, uh, to overall productivity and, and yields and packouts and what have you. Um, and, but nematodes do have long-term sort of chronic stresses on vigor, even though they don't really take trees down on their own. Uh, they increase susceptibility to other stresses and, and they also contribute to root disease complexes. So there are, there, as everybody knows, there are other fungal pathogens out there and in the presence of nematodes, uh, these uh, things kind of come together in a little bit more extreme fashion. Um, and, but also uh, plant parasitic nematode populations themselves respond to the management practices that affect overall soil health. And so in this way, they're also indicative of broader changes in, uh, in, in the soil. So we'll dive into this in a little bit more detail. Um, so the plant parasitic nematodes of concern to tree fruit production in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia First and foremost is the root lesion uh, nematode, Pratolinchus penetrans, and, and you've heard all, all about this uh, nematode, I'm sure, many times before. Um, and we'll talk, spend most of our, the rest of this presentation talking about that nematode. But I do want to, to point out that there are nematodes of interest to tree fruit production in the Pacific Northwest and, and, uh, and in Canada, uh, in British Columbia. And one that has really kind of come up more and more on our radar is the ring nematode, or mesocricanemo, uh, Mesocricanema xenoplax. This nematode uh, is not an issue on apple, um, but it potentially is an issue on cherry, and we're trying to work this out. It's well known uh, to be an issue on peach and plum uh, in places like California and the southeastern United States, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, uh, and we're just starting to learn, we're starting to find it more and more in uh, cherries and grapes, and uh, we're starting a little bit more about it. Dagger nematodes, um, are not directly important um, in that, you know, in most cases, their population densities uh, in our region are not high enough to directly cause damage, but they are really important to keep in mind and, and, and to be aware of because they vector nepoviruses, a particular class of viruses, 
Uh, tomato ring spot virus is one. Uh, tobacco ring spot virus is another. Uh, cherry rasp leaf virus is another. That And so if these viruses get into your orchards, it's very uh, important to know whether you have these nematodes and, and at what population densities. So most of what we know about the impacts of plant parasitic nematodes on fruit trees is limited to their role in replant issues. And there's a very good reason for this. It's very easy to simulate the replant scenario in greenhouse pot experiments in which you can have an apple seedling and you can grow it in the presence of nematodes right next to one growing in the or without, uh, without nematodes and then compare uh, you know, the growth of those uh, seedlings. So it's very easy to demonstrate the influence of nematodes, essentially their pathogenicity. Um, and in this context, the root lesion nematode has been associated with poor replant growth of apple trees uh, since at least the uh, 1930s, I think is the earliest report I've ever seen. Uh, after World War II, of course, with the advent of, fumi of widespread fumigation and availability of fumigants, uh, we became a lot more aware of the role of these nematodes in, in replant issues. And, and what happens is in longer established orchards, large trees, large root systems, these populations build up through time. And, uh, and then when you go to replant or with, with you know, these little, little seedlings, uh, small, small trees with, with small limited root systems, there are just too many nematodes uh, and they overwhelm uh, the root systems. And the other point I, I wanna make you know, very clearly is that uh, in replant scenarios, these uh, root lesion nematodes are always associated with other root pathogens, Rhizoctonia species, Fusarium species, Pythiums, and Cylindrocarpin or Ilionectria species. And, uh, and so it's important to be aware of that, that nematodes aren't the only pathogen uh, in the soil, but they play a particularly important role because they themselves, as they burrow into roots, enhance susceptibility of roots to uh, some of these other, other pathogens. So one of the interesting questions from a soil health perspective is, do plant parasitic nematodes also affect uh, you know, have direct effects on mature or fruiting trees. And the reason I bring this up even as a question is because sometimes when we we're so focused on the replant uh, scenario and we talk and we get focused on it and we, we talk about, you know, doing management practices to minimize such as fumigation or, or what have you to minimize population densities at the time of planting. And if we can just protect those roots for the first couple, three years, uh, then the trees are up and running and we're good to go. And then we often kind of wipe our, you know, uh, brush our hands and think, well, you know, the, the once a tree is established, it can probably withstand uh, nematode populations. And this is, you know, it's kind of a, it's almost a conventional wisdom that's been put out there. But in fact, I mean, these are parasites. They are still building up in their populations on established trees. And so, yeah, I think we can say, yes, they are affecting mature fruiting trees, but it's, it's very difficult to measure, which is why we do not have a lot of strong in, uh, information on it. Uh, as kind of similar to what I was indicating before, it's difficult to do controlled experiments with mature trees uh, compared to say uh, greenhouse pots. Uh, effects accumulate over time on a long lived perennial crop. So feeding in this year and nematode feeding in the next year will, in, you know, will impact growth and productivity five years down the road. Uh, and similarly, the effects, because they accumulate like this, they're out of sync often with population densities. So if you're measuring population densities now, but the tree, the status of the tree is reflecting population densities that were three years ago or two years ago, uh, then very often uh, you don't get a, you know, it's difficult to get a good quantitative relationship between population densities and the way the tree is performing. And of course, being out in the field and, and in relation to other pathogens and things like that, as I mentioned, uh, in general, the effects can be obscured by many other factors that are also affecting the trees. Uh, but nonetheless, there have been a few studies that have successfully correlated or related in some way, sometimes they're very complex statistical models, but they, they ultimately correlate um, the vigor or yield potential across sites with population densities of root lesion nematodes. And so like this project that Tiana has been working on and was just describing is, is one example of this. And so this is kind of underscores the value of this kind of work. The soil health work uh, also leads fundamentally to a better understanding of the relationship between nematodes and productivity on the, out on the landscape. I'm um, just, before I leave this topic of the mature fruiting trees, I'm just gonna throw out a food for thought 
uh, I've always been curious about the role of nematodes in these high density planting systems vis-a-vis -vis the old, the good old days, so to speak, where we had very large trees with very robust root systems. And I can't help but wonder uh, if these high, if these systems are more vulnerable than the previous generation of orchards. And you know, it, it's difficult to do that kind of experiment because the whole system has shifted through time. So, um, so I'm going to provide an experimental and one of the few experimental examples of the impact of nematodes on uh, established trees that that I know of or that, I, that I've been able to find. And this is Jerry Santo down in Prosser way back in the mid 1980s. He did this work and it was a site that had P. penetrans and the site was uh, Granny Smith on M7 and in years four through seven of this planting. So not super mature trees, but at least you know established and fruiting. Um, uh, Jerry went in and applied a nematicide that we no longer have available. It's called Phenamophos or Nemacure. It was a very effective nematicide and it was fairly specific. And he applied it and successfully suppressed the nematode populations. Uh, and, and I should point out, he, he did a, uh, uh, a, a spring application as well as a, a spring and fall split application, which is why there are three different bars on, on that graph. And but basically, and so he was able to suppress the nematode populations. And in response, he got improved growth, yield, and net returned productivity. And so this is you know, one of the few examples from us. From, the, from a field experiment uh, in which nematode populations were manipulated and there was a corresponding improvement uh, uh, in, in growth of the trees. Not that I'm saying that we should go back to using Nemacure or anything like that, but uh, it, 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 it also illustrates how sometimes these, these chemicals can be good experimental tools to help us understand something. Another example of the impacts of nematodes on established trees comes from uh, the stone fruit ring nematode uh, situation. And, and it's, uh, there's a disease complex called peach tree short life, and these nematodes play a very important role in it. And so a lot of work has been done using, using an approach we call microplots, where there are large chambers out in the field that, uh, where the soil is fumigated and then re-inoculated with the nematodes so you can control whether the nematodes are there, just like a greenhouse experiment, but it's just much bigger and more complex because it's out in the field, and grow the trees up to a decent size. And so what a number of researchers have found is that the presence of these nematodes increases susceptibility of the trees to Pseudomonas and Cytospora cankers. And the graph shown down here is a graph of the size of the lesions for trees that are growing in microplots with or without uh, these ring nematodes. And so you can see that in the presence of the ring nematodes, the lesions caused by uh, inoculation with Pseudomonas are much larger. And so this is a, a really interesting example of how it's kind of these indirect effects, if you will, of, of the, the impacts of nematodes uh, on production. Now, this is just an example. I throw this out there. No similar work has, well, first of all, ring nematode doesn't go to apple, but, but even in the context of, uh, of other nematodes, such as Pratolinchus, this type of experiment has, has not been done. And I think it's something that would be useful to do uh, in the future to help us understand these more nuanced influences uh, of nematodes on trees. So now I'm gonna shift in kind of the second half of what we're talking about, which is how do management practices that are intended to improve soil health and, and to, intended to increase organic matter inputs and improve soil health, how might they lead to plant parasitic nematode suppression or regulation of their populations? And, and the basis for this, uh, why we even look at it is because, and just so you, that you're aware, there are a number of types of natural enemies of nematodes that exist in the soil naturally. Uh, there are nematode trapping fungi, fungi in the soil that literally create these little uh, adhesive knobs or, or loops that the nematodes get uh, caught up in. And that's what that picture on the lower right is. There are other microinvertebrates such as tardigrades, uh, this little bear looking uh, creature there that's actually related to a nematode that eat other nematodes. There are predaceous nematodes as Tiana uh, mentioned before. And so the third one up there is a nematode the predaceous nematode eating another nematode. And there are fungi that, that actually colonize that are endoparasites of, of nematodes. So these are just examples of the multitude of natural enemies. And there are mites and, and, uh, and microarthropods as well. So the multitude of natural enemies. And the basic underlying idea is you know, increasing soil organic matter inputs in different ways. Do you stimulate uh, growth of some of these natural enemies in such a way that it has a regulatory effect on the nematode populations? And so we've been working 
uh, on this for a long period of time of a lot of nematologists uh, globally. There are experimental approaches in which we set out experiments such as David uh, described earlier, mulches, organic amendments, etc. And then we monitor or measure changes in uh, lesion nematode populations uh, and corresponding changes in populations of these natural enemies to see if there's a connection there. Um, but then also similar to the soil health work, we can look at correlations between plant parasitic nematode populations and soil health indica in indicators or perhaps populations of the beneficial organisms across uh, a range of sites of varying management history. So I'm gonna kind of give you some examples uh, using different approaches to get a feel for the degree of nematode suppression that we can relate to organic matter management. The first example comes from a cherry, uh, from an experiment we did up in uh, BC, uh, started a number of years ago in 2014. We went into an old apple orchard uh, and, and tilled up the, just the rows and went right back into the rows of the old apple orchard. So it's kind of a worst case scenario from a replant perspective. But we split those rows up into five different plots. We had a control where we didn't do anything. Fumigated was sort of our positive control. Uh, one set of plots, we incorporated compost at, uh, at 50 dry tons per hectare. Uh, another one, we in, uh, put, a, put on a, a thick bark mulch right after planting. And then, we, of course, we had a combined uh, treatment as well. And we had multiple rows, some of which were microsprinkler irrigated and some of which were drip irrigated, which I won't get in, into that aspect of it. But just to quickly give you an, an example, just from a nematode management uh, perspective, the graph on the bottom left, uh, the very first set of bars to the left, you see the red bar. So that's the nematode populations in the soil uh, in the fumigated plots. So very low, just residual populations left. Uh, and then all the other treatments have sort of similarly high root lesion nematode population densities. The next set of bars is 18 months later. And you'll notice that, that in the fumigated plots, by that point in time, they had the highest root lesion nematode population densities. And perhaps more importantly, the lowest nematode population densities were in the plots where we had incorporated compost or where we had compost and mulch together, which were the two sort of the solid uh, brownish, reddish colored uh, bar, and then the, the, the hatched one to the right of it. And uh, so this is really interesting because A, it demonstrates the possibility of suppressing uh, these organisms through time with the addition of this organic matter, but it also kind of conversely shows how in the fumigated plots, we got an explosion of these nematode populations and this has been observed before in other systems. And, and this is due to elimination of those natural enemies that are nat nat uh, naturally suppressing the populations. I think it's an important point to make uh, about how management, soil management practices, in this case fumigation, can have deleterious effects uh, uh, in the long run. The top right-hand graph is basically trunk cross-sectional area or you know, size of overall vigor through the years of the experiment up, in, up through 2017. And you see right off the, you know, at the end of the first year, the best growth was in the fumigated plots, just what we want to see. And it's actually, it's small relative to the other years, but it's uh, significant relative to the other treatments in that year. But as you see, in general, as the years go by, those uh, organically amended plots uh, rally. Uh, they, and, and by the end, by 2017, uh, they're basically uh, starting to exceed uh, growth in the fumigated plots showing the long-term benefits uh, of this uh, kind of approach, alternative to fumigation. And the PhD student we had working on this, I just wanna point out, did a lot of really nice work on the microbes colonizing the rhizosphere of the cherry seedlings plant planted in, in these plots and demonstrated that with the organic amendment in you know, this, this compost treatment in particular, much enhanced total uh, populations of beneficial bacteria and fungi, in particular a group called the pseudomonads that are related to biological control in the rhizosphere, and in particular uh, pseudomonads that are expressing uh, genes for production of, of two different types of antibiotics that are, have been related to biological control of pathogens in the rhizosphere, and that's DAPG and PRN. So, uh, so the next example I want to give you is kind of almost a hybrid between a replant experiment and, and a longer term mulching experiment. And this work was actually done uh, down in Natchez uh, back in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. And uh, what we did, and so there's 
quite a complex arrange, arrangement of treatments in this uh, experiment, but the main ones I want to home in on right now is that there was a, uh, right after planting, uh, there was an alfalfa mulch, uh, alfalfa hay mulch applied, and, and I'm comparing this to plots where we did not have an alfalfa, alfalfa hay mulch. And I should point out that this, this block was all, the entire thing was fumigated at, at the beginning of the experiment. So fumigation wasn't a treatment in the experiment, but the entire thing had been fumigated. And so the top graph is populations of bacterial feeding nematodes, which I'm just showing you those ones as an indicator of overall biological activity uh, in these soils. And you see dancing along there through the years for the first four years, five years, the, the, the dotted line uh, has the great, is, is under the mulched plots, so much higher populations of bacterial feeding nematodes. And we had similar data uh, demonstrating increased populations of the omnivore, omnivorous and predaceous nematodes. It wasn't quite as consistent, but the similar trend. The bottom graph is uh, root lesion nematode population densities uh, in these soils. And you see the complete uh, converse of what we found with the free living nematodes in that through time, the root lesion nematode populations did come back as we would expect in, in any fumigated site, but they come back much more rapidly and to higher levels in the uh, uh, non-mulched plots than in the mulched ones. And we think this is again due to enhancement of the overall soil food web, increased populations of beneficial organisms that may be preying on or predating uh, uh, those root lesion nematodes. So the final ex example from a field experiment that I want to show you uh, is, is from an experiment that we did on uh, organically compatible orchard floor management systems that we did up in British Columbia with uh, Jerry Nielsen was the lead of this, this project. And, and this is the project that David mentioned earlier. We had four treatment options, annual compost application with shallow tillage, a geotextile fabric mulch, alfalfa alleyway where we grew, uh, or sorry, uh, alleyway vegetation, of alfalfa primarily, and we did a mow and blow with it. And then we had the good old bark and wood chip mulch treatment as well. And I won't go into the, all the details on this, but through the years, we observed many benefits, particularly under the wood chip mulch relative uh, to the, the other treatments. Uh, benefits to soil or, overall soil organic matter, active fraction of, of organic matter or, or particular organic matter, microbial activity, uh, free living nematode indicators of soil health, et cetera. But in this particular experiment, we did not uh, see any effects, suppressive effects on root lesion nematodes. And, uh, and so, so you know, I point this out just to illustrate that with these kinds of systems, uh, these scenarios in which we're uh, you know, overall improving soil health and you know, that they don't necessarily translate to a, managed, to a control treatment with respect to soil-borne pests and pathogens, um, but uh, nonetheless, you're getting all sorts of benefits uh, aside from that. And so it's a little bit more unpredictable than, than what we, we typically look for, for quote, control management practices. But, uh, and so I, I kind of want to wrap up here with one last example, which is one of these correlation among sites types of examples. And so this was a, a graduate student we had uh, working with us, uh, Paige Monroe, who took so a much smaller in scale than Tiana's uh, project, but 18 cherry sites up and down the Okanagan Valley, took soil, did a growth bioassay as Tiana described with, for apple. And so uh, Paige did this with cherry, the growth bioassay. And then she also on those soil samples measured a whole bunch of soil properties, including uh, indicators of soil biological activity and uh, pox carbon as indicators of, of soil health. And so the graph, the two graphs on the top right that you see, the on the x-axis is a measurement of fluorescein diacetate activity, which is basically an indicator of microbial activity. And the two different graphs, one of them is, is for uh, plant weight, uh, overall plant weight in the bioassay, and the other one is for shoot height. So they're, they're pretty comparable, and they both get at the same thing. And so what I want you to, so in the interpretation of this, it's, it's toward, towards the left, you see all the the high uh, sites, so those are sites or soils where there was a significantly positive response to, so, to pasteurization of the soil or, or improvement in, in growth due to pasteurization. So these were sites where there, were a lot of, there was a lot of pathogen pressure. And, but then as you move to the right, sites that had higher levels of overall microbial activity, you actually had the opposite where pasteurization, if anything, decreased uh, 
uh, growth of, of, the, of the trees. So this is illustrating the relationship between overall soil biological activity and essentially pathogen pressure. But then also we have the same relationship down the bottom left between fluorescein diacetate hydrolysis, as we're just describing, and the degree to which the roots in those bioassay plants were colonized by these root lesion nematodes. So, so that's a, an in-field or a cross-site uh, demonstration of some of these relationships that we expect to see. So just concluding thoughts on plant parasitic nematodes. They are good indicators of soil health, or, or you, to put it another way, they should be considered as one of the many things that we can measure as a, as a comprehensive assessment of soil health. This is largely because they are direct determinants of the root health function of soil health. They directly affect root health. Uh, and their population densities can be correlated with yields and packouts. And, and we're starting to get a little bit better handle on this. We didn't have a lot of information along these lines, but Tiana's uh, big soil health study, Paige's recent study, and various others are starting to point in this direction, that it is possible to, to directly relate. And, uh, but also soil organic matter management practices can suppress root lesion nematode populations in addition to the many other well-documented benefits. So there is a linkage between overall soil health and uh, populations of, of these organisms. And, uh, and just as a caveat, responses to mulch alone are not consistent. So I'm gonna stop here. I probably have gone over time and, and just thank everybody for listening. It, it's hard to gauge uh, <laughs> of when, uh, when we're doing this electronically, but uh, uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it was informative.